We have a mission to accomplish before we design. Episode 169. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I am your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I am speaking with Matteo Zalio, who is an architect by training, an inclusive design activist, a researcher, an academic, a practitioner, and a coach. And Matteo is quite an incredible character. And this was a fascinating conversation. Much of Matteo's mission is to help understand the people's needs through inclusive user design research. Um, he helps discover insights to help design and the strategy uh, and the visualization and prototype of solutions. He helps develop design requirements, best practice guidelines through technical writing, reviewing and reporting. And he helps connect individuals, inspire and share knowledge and design outcomes with a flavor of optimism and energy. So a bit about Matteo's background. He's got a master's degree in architecture. Um, he has a PhD in UX design from the University of Genoa and Loughborough. Um, he also moved to Ireland at the technical University Dublin as a postdoc research fellow in the School of Electric and Electronic Engineering, where he was working as a UX researcher uh, on human-centered assistive technology. He founded the Irish startup Dean Design Lab, which was focused on delivering accessible products and services to the community, of which the award-winning Smart Bicycle Light tailed was created. After that, he moved to the US as a Fulbright Research Fellow at Stanford, uh, working as a UX researcher at the Center for Design Research and later as a UX design researcher at the Autonomous System Laboratory. And most recently, he has started at the University of Cambridge as a Senior UX Research Fellow, working and helping designers to create environments that guarantee inclusivity, diversity, equity, and accessibility. So an very impressive um, CV and background of architecture and UX design, uh, research, academic, and actually working with practitioners to accomplish results. And this conversation, Matteo and I explore these themes, what it means to the industry of architecture and the future of inclusive design and what it means for business. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Matteo Zalio. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hey, oh, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you? I'm doing great, Rian. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Excellent. Now, I'm very excited to speak with you because you're one of these very um, interesting architects who has entered into various different domains. Um, you do a bit of, a bit of coaching, researching, designing a very eclectic uh, career path that has emerged for you. Um, and I know that you, one of the kind of taglines that you use to describe yourself as, as a, an inclusive design activist. So I guess the first question is, how would you describe your current career? What, what is it that you, that you say that you do? Rian, that's a very difficult question to answer because you just listed uh, all my passions. So starting from doing some design as an architect, I have a master's degree in architecture, then understanding more about people's behavior and what they want to have, what their needs are. So doing some research mm -hmm. and then trying to mentor people, to coach people and, and share with them what I learned from my experience as an architect and as a researcher in academia. I think I can just summarize what I do as a problem solver. I like to find problems. I like to use analytical methods to understand these problems and solve these problems in a way that people can, uh, can get benefits mm -hmm. from the products, the services, or the environments they use. So I could say an inclusive problem solver, maybe. So, so the the area of your research, and you've you've been conducting a lot of this research at Cambridge, is that right? Correct. Yeah. 
Um, what what is that? What's what's been your sort of the main body of your thesis, if you like, or the the kind of domain that you're exploring? Well, I noticed uh, during my practice uh, as an architect and uh, in the following years as a researcher that when we try to design a building, an environment, a city that has to be accessible and truly inclusive for the variety of people uh, that are living across different countries in the world, well, sometimes it's a very challenging problem. It's a so-called wicked problem. Mm. And so I got very much interested into really finding the details behind uh, the challenges that architects, designers, and engineers experience uh, and try to address those challenges, well, not all of them, <laughs> but at least some of them by doing research. And that's basically what I've been doing for part of my career and uh, more uh, importantly, or possibly more uh, importantly here at Cambridge, at the, mm -hmm. the University of Cambridge. Brilliant. And your research, does it manifest itself into actual products? I understand, you know, you've, you, one of the interesting things I saw the work of yours was the, the, the COVID tool for opening the doors, for example. So <laughs> interesting. It, is a lot of the research yeah. that you do, uh, how is it kind of manifesting itself? Is it written publication work or is it actually manifesting itself as products? I love this question because it really helps me to, to tell you more about me and my passions because mm. I find as an academic that there are a lot of opportunities to really explore uh, the problems, to really mm -hmm. dig into these details behind the problems that people experience. And, you know, the outcomes for academics are mostly publications, journal mm -hmm. articles, uh, conference articles, patents, and so on. But as a, you know, in my soul, I still feel I am a designer. I'm somebody that has to make tangible outcomes so that are not just papers, but like products or services or tools to help other designers to design better. And well, as you can see from my website, the handy, the multi-tool to slow the spread of COVID-19 when all started in March 2020, actually that's a manifestation of how much I love to analyze the context, look around for the people, uh, people's problems and try not just to write papers by doing research, but try to act and make and design objects that can be useful for people. So products in that case. And, and was these, were these products part of the, the startup, um, the, Dean, the Dean Design Lab? Great question. Uh, yeah, well, I embarked myself in a journey a few years ago uh, that was uh, about opening a startup uh, because I felt that I could really do more uh, in terms of practical outcomes other than, you know, doing research and producing literature and, and findings that were described into a journal and conference articles. So yeah, Andy was part of the startup as other products that I made, like Tailed, uh, a smart bicycle uh, light, uh, Mowards, an app for health and well-being. And these are basically the results of the research that I've done, the theoretical and exploratory research that I've done uh, that allow me to create something tangible to solve the problems that we found during the research. Now, you've got a background as well in architecture as design but also in ux design and designing of of interfaces can you tell us a little bit about what what that kind of research is and about how would you would describe the domain of of ux and how has it integrated with architectural design well i love this question because uh First of all, when I started architecture, I have a master degree in architecture from, uh, from Italy, University yeah. of Genova. And um, I studied five years, uh, a master degree in Italy. We have this uh, five years long degree. And when I started architecture, I have to say that there was a lot of focus on uh, uh, the building itself, aesthetics, functionality, the mechanics, uh, and statics of the of the building, math, uh, 
physics and so on, and of course a lot of uh, humanistic uh, uh, classes. However, I felt that uh, I needed to learn more about people. I needed to learn more about uh, having a mindset uh, that could allow me to be a people-centric designer, not a sort of a sort of egocentric or self-centric designer that was mostly interested in to shaping uh, an aesthetically pleasant, uh, perhaps, uh, or or a, um, a stunning shape uh, of mm. a building. And so at that stage, I well, after my degree, I got the chance to work uh, a, a bit for different architectural studios and, uh, and offices in Italy. And then I learned that uh, I could learn more. I discovered that I could learn more about this people-centric mindset. And that is what user experience design and user experience research are about. So I started my PhD in user experience design and I focused on understanding how we could design technologies for smart homes that would help, for example, older adults or people with disabilities to live a more independent life. Mm. And once I started doing this user research, so interviewing people, running focus groups, running surveys, doing usability studies and so on, I really got a thorough understanding that uh, when we design either a building, a product or a service, uh, we have to start by people with a human first approach. And that's, I think, really what made me realize that it's important to do your research before, analyze the problems, think about the people holistically, and then try to um, define your design strategy and plan according to what these the people needs are. And yeah, that's pretty much how I got into from being an architect, shifting a bit towards a uh, designer design approach and then becoming, I would say, more a researcher mm -hmm. uh, throughout my life. It, it's interesting when we look at UX design, um, perhaps in the realm of software and computing platforms and, um, and, and, and technology as it is today, where there is a culture of UX design is so fundamental to producing a good product. And it's also UX design is really deeply related with entrepreneurship and the success of the product as a whole and you know its usability is going to be is going to make the difference between someone choosing to stick with this platform versus going on to another platform and so there's a real kind of commercial sense that's linked up there with usability um, and, and because it's kind of almost instantaneous as well you know because it's about people's attention um, and if you know if we lose people's attention here then the product is going to not be as successful how does this translate into architecture where we we don't necessarily have we don't have the same sort of feedback that you might get from a piece of software like you're not able to necessarily get the same kind of metrics and understanding how usable a building is and whether people are you know what people are actually doing in the in the in the building and nor is there necessarily that kind of commercial relationship either to the usability how 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 do you view this kind of very interesting parallel. I love this parallel, Rion. It's really what um, uh, what drove uh, all the research effort that I have done so far. And I got to a point where I'm really trying to literally coach and, and share knowledge to, to people, for example, from the building industry, that we have to learn more from uh, for example, tech companies, software companies, where mm -hmm. they have the opportunity really to embed user research at the very early stage of a product or prototype development, and then get the data, get the insights or of what the real challenges that people, that customers are experiencing, and embed this data, these findings into the design process. When you create a, a UI, a user interface, a button, a function of the software, well, this is the second stage, designing the software. And then you continue to test and evaluate, and you are lucky enough to get user feedback because you can get a lot of data from, uh, for example, using a software or using a product. 
when we talk about buildings, uh, it is challenging because buildings are very, very complex environments, either in the design, plan, pre-construction, construction and operation of a building. There are so many variables, and I call that as a weak problem, a very complex problem to solve. Mm. Well, what, I'm, what I've been trying to do with the research is really to embed the uh, UX, re, UX research mindset and thinking into architects and designers mindset so that when they start designing and planning they start by involving users by getting feedback and data from them examples creating a community engagement sessions using co-design sessions running surveys running focus groups with the client and the future building occupants so these are things that have been done already extensively but i would love, I would really love that uh, these stages would be applied at all levels of the uh, design uh, of a new building or a, fur or a refurbishment of, of, mm -hmm. uh, of a space uh, from a small to a very large firm. And then when you get this information, this data, you continue to get information from uh, with Beam software, for example, from uh, the uh, general contractors, the constructors that are uh, working in the, uh, in the phase of construction of the building. And then the most important phase, when you deliver the building is really the moment where people are gonna get in. And there is when it starts, the real moment when you continue to get information, data from environmental sensors, from post-occupancy surveys, from mixed method audits, uh, in order to really keep the space, the building functional mm -hmm. and as a space that help people thrive. So basically trying to learn from user research, user experience design in the tech industry and try to bring that into the building industry. This is a very, I think a very important avenue of, of research and something that I, I think a lot of architects would like to be involved in and also you know there there is there is a big void in terms of the data that we have to work with when designing buildings and wh why do you think there is such a void in this data because it it often seems that you know an architect's job you design the building you know sometimes you've, you've done the design and then that's it you're not involved in the process anymore if you're lucky you're involved all the way through to construction but then you hand the keys over essentially and then again the relationship stops what why, why is this happening do you think well i believe uh, there are two aspects here that we should consider before uh, making you know an assumption the first mm -hmm. one is that the whole process of designing, planning, constructing, and delivering a building or, or an environment it could be a piece of a city, a neighborhood, or just a, a little office space, is that uh, the process is very much fragmented. Uh, there are a lot of actors throughout the process that are stepping in at different stages, and this makes the process very fragmented. And, and nowadays, we actually are, are really seeing a rise of software from different uh, companies are really helping to, to put together data information into a process that is more uh, linear and more integrated. And the second aspect uh, that I wanted to mention is really about uh, awareness and knowledge. So all these actors that are part of this fragmented process, they know they are experts in a very small niche, in a small domain area. And it's, it's true and it's, uh, and it's fine because, you know, we cannot be, there are people who are generalists, but you know, if you're a generalist, uh, sometimes you cannot solve some technical problems. Mm -hmm. I think there are some figures that are the generalists, for example, the architects uh, that have an extreme strong power here to really bring all the uh, technical experts together under a sort of umbrella that allows them to unleash their potential because they are extremely technical, but also coordinate them by not just thinking about the aesthetics or the functionality of the building, but really thinking about who is going to be in the building. Mm. And by doing this, you mentioned before about 
access and usability. Well, these are really important things because if people cannot get into the building and use the building, well, the goal is not achieved. But I believe there are much more um, aspects to consider here, which are really about making people thrive and making, making people that are living and spending time in a building um, that are happy, comfortable, and they feel included somehow. Mm -hmm. What what is um, when you kind of talk about the, the title of inclusive design and making sure that we're making environments that are accessible for 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 everybody? What do you see as some of the kind of common faults in in architectural design that are that are that are emerge? And again, kind of looking at what might be some of the root causes for that for that type of thing to emerge in a design. Well, I, I could say that a recent study that we have done at Cambridge, uh, uh, so with this study, we found that uh, around 10% of survey respondents reported that building owners are well informed about the benefits of designing inclusively. When exactly we talk about inclusive design, as you mentioned before. And we interestingly found that uh, more than seven out of 10 building industry professionals think that clients and building owners don't really perceive the value of inclusive design. Now, what inclusive design is? Well, <laughs> some people might think it's about designing an accessible entrance, putting an elevator in the building, and maybe um, uh, designing and, and using certain type of handles for the doors. But I think it goes really above that uh, this simple definition. And so, Going above the definition of simply accessibility is really about thinking of access, but also about the senses, what people feel with their senses, but also what people feel and think with their mind. Mm. In fact, we talk a lot about neurodiversity now in the built environment, because we have to understand that how we interact with the space and how we interact with other people is a result of what we perceive around us. Is the space making us feel comfortable? Do I feel cold? Do I feel distracted because mm -hmm. there are too many colors around me in the building or in the office? And so all these small, tiny factors are really affecting our behavior, our actions, and our behavior and our actions influence the sphere of uh, socialization. So if you are angry or grumpy in the morning because it's cold and in the office uh, there is not enough light and it's rainy and cloudy outside, you know, we might have more chances to feel grumpy with our co-worker. Mm -hmm. So all these aspects are really embedded into this definition of inclusive design, which, as I said before, tries to go above and beyond the simple definition of making a space accessible and usable for as many people as possible. What kind of research is being done in terms of like on the client side so that clients are becoming more educated in say how inclusive design not only you know improves the experience of using the building for its occupants but actually is deeply in alignment with whatever their business and financial agendas are? Well, that's a great question because we we get to the important topic of uh, knowledge and, and making sure people are aware of what inclusive design means. So still focusing on, on some of the numbers, the data we, we found from uh, our survey, we, we understood that uh, the scarcity of clients' awareness of inclusive design was very much, very strongly correlated with the lack of perceived value of inclusive design. So what that means? In a few words, that means that uh, uh, the limited awareness that people, the clients have about inclusive design doesn't allow to perceive a real value from an inclusively designed building. So as a result of this biased perception, the scarcity of clients' awareness becomes a sort of a driver of the insufficiency of clients' request. 
So in a few words, this means that if we as architects and designers who we know about the standards, the regulations, uh, and all the technical documents that allow us to design more accessibly and more inclusively, well, if we don't share the knowledge, if we don't advocate for it, and if we don't build the business case mm-hmm. for inclusive design for our clients, well, then it's going to be very tricky to have them to require for an inclusively designed building from their end, right? Yes. So we as architects and designers, we have uh, we have a really, um, we have a mission to accomplish before we design. We have really to strive for designing buildings that are healthy and buildings that guarantee inclusion, diversity, equity, and are accessible for all. Mm-hmm. I, I guess I suppose one of the other challenges is that a, a client would have is that many of the occupants or users of the building are not necessarily in their in the got anything to do with the client anyway. So a building has many stakeholders, some being the actual client owner, building owner. Then there's the tenants of the building, if we're talking about a commercial property. Then there might be people who are using the building who are not tenants or who are not on the ownership part. They're just kind of interacting with the building and obviously people who are in and around it outside uh, in the kind of sphere of influence of a, of a piece of architecture, which all, um, you know, have this. So it, it becomes quite a, you know, it peters out, if you like, in, in a in a very interesting way. How have you found it's, you know, what, what sorts of things are effective in being able to communicate that commercial value to a client? Well, as, as you said, Rion, um, it's very complex to identify um, the, uh, the vast, uh, um, the larger group of potential uh, building occupants mm-hmm. and users of the building. Yes. Uh, either because we don't know sometimes who are going to be the real users of the building, or either because there is not really, not just knowledge, but uh, interest in understanding and knowing who are going to be these users. Now, let's let's uh, let's start from a fact. Yeah. We know what kind of building that as architects or designers we are, um, we have to design from our client. Either it's an hospital, uh, a school, uh, an office space, uh, a theater, a shopping center. So we know already that there is a sort of constraint uh, for what kind of design we we have to do. The second part is that once we identify what kind of building, what kind of space we have to design, we can follow different approaches. And if we want to design inclusively, it's really about asking the right question and trying to ask questions that are normally out of our comfort zone. Mm. Example, when we uh, try to engage with the community, let's say we're designing a new school and uh, we have, I think we must, not just we have, but we must do some community engagement exercise and we run some focus groups and interviews with the people from the community, and we ask them about what they want. Well, this is not really the question we should ask, because if we ask what people want, they are gonna tell us what they want according to their ideas about uh, what their problems are. Mm -hmm. But we should ask more about their problems, more about their challenges, and once we understand the type of challenge and the type of problem that they experience, we can create, uh, we can really translate their problems and and challenges into user needs, exactly as we do in product development in a tech company, you know, when we do user research and then user experience design. Once we understand about the needs, then we can create the solution. I'll give you a very quick example. Uh, a, A year and a half ago, I had a friend who um, who had an injury and, and got a broken leg. And uh, I was trying to help her and say, well, um, you know, now you're working from home. So what can we do? What can I, how can I help you? And, and she said, well, you know, I just need a wheelchair because I want to move around. I'm, I'm, I'm sick of, I, I want to keep this uh, uh, cast for four months here. And I said, well, wait a minute. 
do you want a wheelchair? But really, do you need a wheelchair? We have to work from home. There is COVID. Um, you can get food delivery at home. Um, we can socialize on Zoom uh, or Teams. Uh, so do you really need a wheelchair? And then she waited at me and I said, mm, well, maybe it's true. I just need to move from my bedroom to the toilet and into the kitchen. So, well, yeah, perhaps you're right. Maybe you, we don't, I don't really need a wheelchair right now. And so I said, well, okay, do you have one of those office chairs with the wheels so you, then you can simply move from the, the toilet to your bedroom? Say, so, yeah, I do. Well, why don't you use that so you don't need to just to walk with some sticks uh, that's going to be tricking your little apartment. And in the end, really, this is a, a very simple example that tells you how we have to identify the challenges and problems first uh, rather than trying to address the wants or the problem with already a solution without really identifying mm. the background information. And this is what we could do and we should do when we design, try to invest a bit more time into this stage, this initial stage. This is so fascinating. And there's, there is so, this this crossover, the parallel between how software tech goes about approaching um, user platforms and there's this kind of high level of iteration. And, you know, it's so important to make sure that the, there's the usability of the end product is kind of, as good as it can be. Of course, when you move into the world of anything that's being fabricated or manufactured, there's a whole another level of complication that comes with with uh, with iterative processes because you're dealing with something physical now. Um, and there's you know, it's just it becomes more complex. But this this idea that actually analyzing and understanding the problems first provides a lot more depth for solutions um, and a lot more richness and possibility and actually the solutions can be a lot more thoughtful if you like as opposed to always trying to build something brand new uh, and there's like you know sometimes the the solution can be more a psychological one is what I'm hearing um, as opposed to actually a physical solution that can be how the it can be kind of reframing how the problem actually occurs for somebody with a with an intervention that might be physical and that actually alleviates alleviates a lot of the um, the problems absolutely Rian and uh, I can hear the voice and I heard the voice of so many architects mm. telling me well you know that's so difficult I mean we don't have time to do that it's not even part of the, you know, if you're based in the United Kingdom of the river stages, you know, it's, it's not really embedded into what is the actual current practice. And I say, I hear you and I understand that. And that's why we, we did our research at Cambridge and we tried to get tools and toolkits uh, to allow this process to become mainstream mm. uh, and to allow architects and designers to really try to embed this sort of uh, user research mode into their early stage design and development process. I mean, do you think that this could become like a, a new standalone service in itself? And actually the potential for it is, you know, as an architectural industry, we're very interested in sustainability and adaptive reuse and making the best out of our existing building stock. Actually, what you're suggesting here is with an effective toolkit for analysis of how you, good our buildings are performing at the moment, there's a whole new world that starts to open up in terms of services that architects could be at the forefront of, of, of leading. Is that, is that part of the intention with the, with the toolkit or, or how it can be used? Or, or not? Well, I think there are several opportunities and one for sure is, is what you mentioned, but I would just give you an example. Mm. Uh, in, in, in the United Kingdom, there is a very important figure, which is uh, the access consultant. Now, it's, it's a very unique figure that is not very popular in other countries in Europe, but I, I, I'm aware it's, it's becoming slowly, but it's becoming. So the access consultant is normally a person that uh, has knowledge of certain standards, such as the ABS 8300, Design for Accessible Environments, the Building Regulation Part M, and other standards and procedures. And, and allows the team, the architects or the client simply, to better understand 
what are the challenges that the building is uh, unfortunately promoting <laughs> to the building occupants and also try to make sure that these challenges are, are going to be addressed with different uh, solutions. Mm. Now, I, I believe that, for example, access consultants will, will become not just accessibility consultants, but like inclusive design consultants. They can really help architects and design teams uh, to focus, for example, on physical capabilities. The fact that we have to physically access and use a building, but also to understand a variety of sensory capabilities. So for example, people are blind, deaf, uh, have different uh, uh, smell sensitivity and so on. But also what is really important, I think, the cognitive capabilities. And here, when we talk about cognitive capabilities, we're talking about neurodivergent individuals, uh, people who have different cultures and speak different languages. In fact, you can hear my accent. Sometimes when I'm, when I'm uh, at a meeting, uh, in a room, well, it didn't happen a lot during COVID, but now it's, things are, are starting to happen again. Well, I have our time sometimes to hear an accent of a person that might be from a different geographical area, especially in, an, in, a, in a meeting room where there is not enough noise absorption. I really struggle to do that. Mm. And so by understanding about these three dimensions uh, that are embedded in the inclusive design canvas in this toolkit that we developed it. University of Cambridge, well, you can really get closer to understanding about these challenges and problems, as I mentioned before. And I would say access consultants now, but I, I would suggest as well architects and designers, because in the end, we are all just trying to make our job as best as yeah. possible. And our job is simply to make buildings, products, or even services that are truly working well for all of mm. us that's that's the main that's the main goal right in the end um with the toolkits that you've been developing could you walk us through um what they comprise of and how an architect might engage or interact with them well for sure i i have to say before starting uh the screen more the the, the toolkit that uh, there is a part of the toolkit that really helps to um, to the architects, designers, engineers during the design phase. And this can be done, as I said, with the Inclusive Design Canvas, which is really a, um, a strategic design template that offers an educational springboard mm. for architectural design professionals to truly embed inclusive design in the design process. But also there is a part which is the post-design process where normally, you know, we perform post-occupancy evaluation. Well, we developed a tool, uh, the idea audit, that with different surveys and mixed method audits uh, allows building occupants to describe their perception of the space in terms of inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. And why it is really important? Well, because it allows the architectural firm to get a feedback about the design they made for that particular mm. building. But also it allows, for example, facility managers, building owners, or just the company that owns that building to better understand what people feel, what, what and where are the pockets of in exclusion, where the challenges are, and so with this data, you can really understand how you can make the building better for the people who are spending time in it. Is there a way where you can start getting this data, if you like, before the building is completed, before there's anything actually physically made? Kind of like, you know, obviously in, in, we use the comparison with um, UX design and they'll go through their beta testing and they've got real life users interacting with it. But in architecture, obviously, we go through a phase of designing in kind of isolation, if you like, and it's only when it's built that we've got real people. H how can we, is there a way to, to kind of have that kind of modeling happening before anything is built? Rian, that's a that's an amazing question, and it's it's very challenging because uh, you mentioned we we work in silos. I mm. mean, we 
we do work differently than uh, we have different opportunities in the building industry rather than the tech mm -hmm. and software industry. Now, what I could say is that you can reduce the likelihood to go with a wrong design if you run a pre-occupancy survey, for example. So let's say we have company A that uh, is, um, is asking us, architectural firm, to uh, redesign their office spaces in central London. We are lucky enough that this company has already building occupants, already employees, and we can run the idea audit as a pre-occupancy uh, survey with a poll survey, a very short uh, seven to 10 minute survey to really gain their perception about what current challenges they experience. Now we can use this data to better inform the design process and focus more, for example, on certain aspects that we might not have the capacity to do if we don't have this prior data. Example, we'll have to focus a lot on the type of materials we use because we know that among the employees, there is a vast majority that is very sensitive to allergies mm -hmm. and to certain smell. And so the type of material we use, the type of painting, the type of carpets, uh, it's really crucial in terms of designing an office space that is going to really make these people, these employees thrive. And then, well, once you deliver the building, you can actually leave uh, room for personalization. And I, and I want just to mention an example where I've seen uh, in a college, uh, in an American university a couple of years ago, they had to design the path that were connecting different parts of the college, uh, uh, where in the central area, uh, in, in the center of the, the buildings, uh, there, were, there should have been then a, a park, a mm -hmm. green area. What they've done was not just to to, um, uh, to create the park after the design, but it kept the land, uh, let's say, with just grass. And they started to, and then they observed after a year, which were the most common path where people were walking in this central area uh, in the middle of the buildings. And then they designed, they planted plants, uh, trees, bushes, and so on, according to what the path that people were using in, in about 12 months time, uh, defined the most popular path to go from A to B or to B oh, to C and so, so on. that's so interesting. So somehow, instead of delivering a building that is completely finished, 100%, when we handle the keys to the building owner or the company in that case, we can say, well, we'll leave 10% or 5% of personalization mm that we can track with this post-occupancy audit, uh, with this idea audit, and see actually where we can shift the little uh, stake here towards a design or towards the mm -hmm. other. That's really fascinating. That's very, that's very, very interesting. You, know, you could imagine, um, you know, lots of infrastructure, for example, I mean, the, the kind of complex modeling that goes into, you know, like airport design or um, any kind of buildings that have got high levels of process inside of them, um, actually leaving this kind of contingency space for post-occupancy design where, you know, certain pathways, certain elements of the building are not complete until we've had people in it and then we can start, um, you know, refining things. Obviously, I suppose that has lots of complication you've got to have complications with you know how the client might perceive again it's kind of perception isn't it the the sort of is the are we getting an unfinished building you're not going to finish it until <laughs> we can't have people in it whilst it's not finished <laughs> yeah yeah it, it's it's very true I, I think you know architects engineers designers now can really make can really build a business case to their mm -hmm. clients uh, because we now have the capacity to use BIM software and collaboration models to really handle data in a way that just simply five, 10 years ago was almost impossible. Mm -hmm. So really now we are at the turning point in the history of uh, the building industry sector, mm -hmm. where really I see the future as a future where somehow buildings uh, are becoming closer 
to what a car, a phone, a computer, a pen, or a chair is, especially from the design process. Now, bear in mind that, you know, buildings are not like cars. You cannot just design a car and replicate for one or two million units. Yeah. You cannot design a building and replicate 100 or 1,000 times because if you replicate that in a different part of the world, for example, there are different weather conditions, different cultural conditions and so on. But what I'm trying to say is that instead of replicating the design itself, we can replicate a process, a model that allows us to get data at the right time and use the data in the right mode and at the right time as well. Brilliant. Um I'm very interested in the the other kind of aspects of your career as well, where, um, for one, you, you're coaching. Would you better tell us a little bit about the kind of coaching that you that you deliver, um, how you help architects and designers? What does that aspect entail? Well, I I I, I simply learned one thing: sharing is better than keeping things for yourself. And so by starting from this simple sentence, I understood that uh, some people call coaching, some people call lecturing, some people call mentoring and so on. Uh, these are just synonyms. If you're in academia, you call that lecturing. If you're in the business context, you call that coaching. If you are in more a sort of student slash uh, early stage uh, career, um, uh, stage of your life, you call that mentoring. But to me, it's really about, I feel, I felt and I feel in it that what I learn, for example, from months or years of research on a specific topic, well, of course, I cannot share all of the content sure. because it, it might take as well months or years, but really create a pill and try to share this pill in a way that is engaging and allows really the community, the, the, the people to understand some concepts that for me might have taken mm. weeks to discover, understand. But I think it's really powerful because in the end, uh, uh, as I mentioned at the start of this answer, you know, uh, if you share, you get, uh, um, you get excited about that, but also you get uh, rewarded because you see you can empower people to become designers or just simply to do better in yeah. life. So that's, I think, a side activity that uh, that um, I like it pretty much. Amazing, yeah. amazing. And what do you have planned for the rest of uh, 2022? Well, <laughs> that's a great question. Well, I think um, there are a lot of plans. There are a lot of um, things going on right now. I think... Uh, um, a plan that for sure is not going to change is to bring to wherever I'm going to collaborate uh, with, uh, for and with and uh, wherever I'm going to work, to bring the uh, curiosity mm -hmm. to understand uh, what's behind the problems. In terms of plans, uh, I think uh, I would like to um, apply the research that I've done so far more into you know the the business context so really trying to help businesses and companies to really uh, achieve uh, the best as they can with my support uh, uh, as a researcher and um, and of course this this means also that you know the inclusive design canvas or the audit uh, the idea audit uh, the research that i've done mm. at cambridge uh, might be used by by professionals by practitioners so yeah these are sort of uh, high level goals for for this 2022 but uh, yeah starting to put them in practice fantastic brilliant matteo thank you very much for your time and and expertise here is there anything um that i've missed anything that you you wished i would have asked you well, Rion, I have to say uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for this chat we had today. I don't think you missed anything. I think you asked uh, great questions. One, one thing I wanted to just add uh, at the end of this chat is uh, a heartfelt thank you for, 
for this podcast series that you are running. Uh, that it's so interesting, and and I think and I hope that all of the listeners will get more curious about inclusive design, about doing some research ahead of mm-hmm. the design stage, and really try to be people-centered designers rather than egocentric designers like I was before. In Absolutely. My life. Thank my, you. Rian. My pleasure. Thank you. I think that's a very pertinent message. And it's so deeply interrelated with entrepreneurship and business is getting inside of the world of our users, of our clients, of other people. Um, It helps not just in our overall design, but our communication, our marketing, everything. So thank you very much, Matteo. Thank you, Ria. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.